Hello and welcome to the 2019 ASCO annual meeting here in Chicago. I'm Rob Jones, I'm a medical oncologist in Glasgow in the UK um, and I'm here with Nick James from Birmingham, uh, Ian Davis from Melbourne and Axel Nurseberger from Lübeck in Germany. Uh, we're actually going to talk about a concept which kind of didn't really feature much in clinical practice until five years ago and this is the concept of additional treatments at the time of first androgen deprivation therapy in patients with hormone-sensitive metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, Nick, we've seen, since that, that, that those first data five years ago at this meeting, yeah. uh, we've seen a plethora of other data in this area. Absolutely. Do you want to just summarise that for us, in particular with emphasis to your trial, the Stampede trial, which of course has been a big part of those data? Yes, it's been a very exciting time, obviously, to be practising oncology. So moving on from the charted data, which Chris Sweeney presented 2014, wasn't it? Uh, we obviously had the confirmatory data from Stampede the this following year. Dosataxel. With, with, with yeah. Dosataxel up front. And followed quite quickly two years later by Stampede and Latitude showing pretty much the same effect yeah. in terms of the impact on survival, different effects on failure-free survival from upfront abiraterone. Obviously, the thing that's been added in terms of drug treatment at this meeting, which uh, is the Enzymet trial, which Ian is going to talk about, I'm sure, and apalutamide. In addition, for low volume disease, uh, Stampede showed that radiotherapy to the primary improved survival by actually about the same amount as docetaxel and abiraterone, uh, if given at the start of treatment, with or without docetaxel. So for low volume disease, we've got a multitude of options, docetaxel, abiraterone, radiotherapy, enzalutamide, apalutamide. There was also that um, curious comparison within Stampede, and this is relevant yeah. to the conversation we're about to have, I think, yeah. uh, where there was an, in, well, it was a direct comparison, or an unplanned comparison between yeah. docetaxel and abiraterone. Absolutely. So, so the docetaxel and abiraterone arms overlapped to the tune of about 600 patients. So um, although technically they're randomised against control, effectively they're randomised against each other. And what we saw was that the hazard ratio between docetaxel and abiraterone, obviously unplanned, and not, not unpowered, but planned, um, was the hazard ratio was one for prostate cancer death. Abiraterone gives you a longer time to progression than docetaxel, but of course you've used up com comprehensively yeah. one of your therapies, so that the CRPC duration post abiraterone is much shorter. So the, the conclusion from that really was that the, 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 so the, the state of the data before yeah. this meeting at yeah. least was that um, you could pretty much choose between docetaxel and abiraterone, at least in terms of efficacy. Absolutely, and it's been yeah. quite striking in the UK. We can't currently use abiraterone up front, and there's been very little pressure from yeah. clinicians to have abiraterone adopted, because I think we are comfortable with the idea that docetaxel gives you the same survival benefit. Yeah. So we've seen two new trials in this arena at this meeting, or the results of two, new, new results of two trials. Um, the first one was the Titan trial. Axel, do you want to just tell us a little bit about what the, what that trial was and the headline data from that trial? Yes, thanks. Um, so definitely, um, as uh, Nick alluded to, we had some game changers in 2015 with uh, uh, charted data and stampede data, 2017 another game changer with uh, abirateron and now 2019. I think this is the year another game changer is introduced uh, in our armamentarium of the treatment of prostate cancer. So we have uh, apalutamide, which we know is approved in some countries in the EU and US in a non-metastatic CRPC, a selective androgen receptor inhibitor, um, which has been um, shown a result a couple days ago here at the ASCO conference, a phase three trial, more than 1,000 patients, and uh, the primary endpoint, the co-primary endpoint Overall survival and progression-free survival were positive. So I think this resulted in a New England Journal publication. Uh, Kim Chi presented this data a couple of days ago. I think it's a game changer. Hazard ratio 0 0.67. I think we hear the number in a couple of minutes yeah, again from Ensamet. Uh, this is a coincidence. And then we have uh, 0 0.48 for progression-free survival. So I think really great data supporting the use of apalutamide in this de novo metastatic prostate cancer setting. And uh, when you say game changer, the clear differentiators between this trial and the trials that have gone before, apart from obviously being a different drug? 
Definitely. And let me give you an example. So in Germany, we have some requests from urologists and also oncologists whether we have high volume disease, high risk disease, can we use or should we use doxetaxel, should we use abirateron. In Germany, abirateron is only uh, licensed in high risk disease, so what we know the risk factors are, and doxetaxel suggested to be used in high volume disease. However, Stampede suggests a similar thing, but uh, this is a proven situation. And here with APA, we have the all comer indication, yeah. which I think right. is a new thing. And that's why I uh, also queued it in with a game changing. Yeah. Well, we'll maybe come back to the high volume, low volume thing in just a minute. But Ian, uh, the other um, big new data we saw at this meeting, actually in the plenary session with the data from the Enzymet trial, um, do you want to just take us through uh, those key findings and, again, what makes that trial different? Thanks, Rob. So we're seeing some consistencies here and some extra pieces of information starting to flesh out the picture. So Enzymet was very similar in design. It was uh, testing the question of addition of enzalutamide to testosterone suppression in men with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer commencing treatment. And we found very similar outcomes to tighten in many and, respects. And so it was all patients regardless of volume, Correct. regardless of risk that's factors. Right, that's yeah. right, yes. Yeah. Uh, so we found very similar findings to tighten in, in that respect. There was an overall survival benefit for the whole population with a hazard ratio of 0.67 and about a 60% reduction in the risk of progression uh, when enzalutamide was added to the entire population. There were fewer distinguishing points for, for, from Enzymet with Titan and with Archers, which we heard about earlier this year. Uh, one was that the control arm in, in Enzymet uh, included a standard anti-androgen, so flutamide, biclutamide or nilutamide. And the second uh, distinction which was brought in in the, in the um, uh, second version of the protocol, after about 88 patients had been recruited, was that we allowed concurrent docetaxel to be used at physician choice. That was not randomised, but we did stratify for that. But it was actually quite a large proportion of the patients randomised in the trial had had docetaxel, have they not? That's right. In the end, about 45 to 50% of uh, patients received docetaxel, uh, more in the high volume group, but a substantial proportion in the low volume group as well. So, so has Lenzomet answered the question about giving docetaxel and an androgen receptor targeted therapy? I'd love to say yes to that, but no, it hasn't. So we found some interesting findings. In men where a decision had been made that docetaxel was to be used, we saw no additional benefit in terms of overall survival by adding enzalutamide. And more than that, we saw some additional toxicity. We saw the expected enzalutamide toxicity, but we also seemed to experience more docetaxel-related toxicity, and that's still unexplained. But you did show quite a significant effect on clinical progression-free survival, even in that subgroup of patients who'd had docetaxel, did you not? That's right, yes. So the benefit was most pronounced in the men who did not have docetaxel, but in terms of progression-free survival, which was the secondary endpoint, PSA, progression-free survival, or clinical progression-free survival, there was a, an additional benefit from adding enzalutamide there. So we need to see if that benefit eventually translates into a survival benefit, and also whether it, uh, the additional toxicity measures up in terms of the quality of life data that we hope to generate over the next few months. Thanks very much. So uh, there's a couple of, couple of sort of broader points that I think it would be really useful to tease apart here. So, um, I mean, let, let's just talk a little bit more about that um, sequential versus combination. Should, should patients just get one drug? Should they get chemotherapy and an androgen receptor targeted therapy? Uh, Nick, what's your feeling on this? Well, my feeling is that actually you're trial and taken together with Titan and Arches does answer the question because as far as I can see there's a very strong signal that you only need one yeah. treatment. There's a very striking lack of any separation of the OS curves and, and as you say an increase in toxicity and there was some evidence of harm if you had DOSI plus APA in the Titan trial and you certainly dilute your failure free survival benefit and you've used up two of your salvage yeah. treatments instead of one. So I, I can't see any particular advantage, In fact, and I can see substantial disadvantages to putting two treatments yeah. in. So I, I, I would feel it just leaves us, you, you've got a choice of single agents, um, but I would just very strongly think you should only have the single agent. Axel, any, are there any patients you would want to give both docetaxel and an androgen receptor targeted therapy to in the hormone sensitive state? 
So the combination, and that was clear from, from Ensamet presentation, I go along with Nick's uh, a summary that uh, aside adding um, financial toxicity, I see no clinical benefit as, as of yet, and this is different in Titan, which is a different uh, trial design. We had 11% patients with uh, prior doxetaxel, but this was prior and not concomitant like in Ensamet. So I think um, this was like, uh, Half of the patients had a combination, half of the patient had a sequence in Ensamet, where in Titan, a different trial design, it was like a sequence. And then the question derives what comes after progression, but I totally agree that the three combination, backbone, ADT, and something else makes sense, but not a triple combination. Yeah. And of course, there are other data that we're going to see in the, in the near future, yes. I imagine, which will give us more information about this. So, uh, so we, we seem to be agreed that, it's, um, that, that a patient should have either docetaxel or an androgen receptor targeted therapy. How do we choose? Your data have shown that there's no kind of difference in terms of efficacy. Um, um, Axel, again, maybe how, 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 do you, how, how, do, how do you think we should choose which patients should get docetaxel and which patients should get whichever your choice of apalutamide, enzalutamide, or avaratamide? That's be? a big question now. And um, in case we have all four approved now, best and four approved and also financed, I think this is a decision we have to make with the patient. Uh, according to um, side effects, according to toxicity, you know, the peripheral neuropathy and the hair loss in doxetaxel, which uh, some won't affect with it. <laughs> And some, it makes really a difference in quality of life. And I think this taking into account, and on the other hand, um, you don't need uh, an apalutamide, you don't need the um, prednisone, which you need for doxetaxel, at least when you give it, which you need for abirateron, which is a different with enzalutamide, you don't need it. So there are some factors that uh, differentiate among the treatment, but we don't have head to head, for example, uh, abirateron, doxetaxel as of yet. Um, so I think um, given the data we have from Titan, given the 33% risk reduction of death, I would feel very confident starting in this all-comer situation with apalutamide. Ian, any, any thoughts from the Australian perspective on this? The Australian perspective is pretty straightforward. We've only got access to docetaxel in this, in this setting. But there's another way of thinking about that. This is a fear of missing out situation. And I don't think anyone out there should feel that, oh, if I'm being recommended to have this treatment and not this one, that in any way that they should be missing out. The evidence... So it provides reassurance. It provides reassurance. There's no wrong yeah. answer here. I think yeah. any of these options individually is reasonable. Yeah. So it comes really down to a discussion with the patient. What, what is their particular circumstance? Do they have other comorbidities? Are there financial implications? Are they happy to have a long period of treatment with an oral hormonal agent or a short, sharp course of six cycles of docetaxel and get everything out of the way. Everyone have a different preference and every answer is a reasonable one. So, so, so what about volume of disease, burden of disease, however you want to, to label it? Um, Nick, <laughs> what's your feelings on, 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 on this and helping us make this decision to choose how to treat patients? Yeah, so, so as, as you obviously know, I, I have quite strong views on this because I, I feel that the charted high volume load volume thing is a bit of a manufactured distinction driven by relatively small numbers underpowered and, and, and it's changed on the two different analyses they've done. They came to one conclusion with the first and a different conclusion with the second in terms of the test for interaction and stuff. Um, so in Stampede, we don't see any evidence of... of that those attacks only works in one subgroup. And we're going to show further data on this at ESMO, which obviously I can't comment on in detail. But uh, I, I think it's a mistake to say that those attacks doesn't work in low volume patients. Um, I, think it, I think I very much think it does. And I think we've fairly comprehensively seen that it makes no difference at all in terms of any of the androgen receptor targeted Absolutely. therapies as well. Yeah. Um, what about though, what about radiotherapy to the primary? <laughs> So, uh, so we presented data at uh, ESMO last year, Chris Parker presented it and we published it obviously, so, uh, and we published a meta-analysis with the HORAD trial. So in, uh, very convincingly we saw probably actually exactly the same hazard ratio rather than as we see with the androgen receptor targeted therapies between two different trials testing essentially the same treatment, radical radiotherapy. So we, we are very convinced and the peer reviewers at the Lancet were very convinced it was a robust conclusion. And, and so that was, but that was just positive in the low volume yeah. as per the charted definition. So, so we use the charted definition just to make for ease of alignment yeah. with other trials. Um, we've actually done some sensitivity testing of the imaging thing and um, uh, 
yeah, we're not so sure the charted way of classifying is necessarily the best way, but it's a way that's used, so it's easy to, to cross compare. But the, it, there was a, the survival gain was a, around the same as the, the survival, it was between the survival gain of those attacks and abiraterone. So it, it's a big gain from a really quite short, simple treatment. So you've got a patient with low volume, newly diagnosed metastatic prostate cancer, you're going to give them ADT, you're going to give them radiotherapy. I think so. Are you going to give them another drug too? <clears throat> and well, if so, which one? <laughs> well, uh, uh, until we saw the data here, I would say for sure you would, you know, these are different classes of drug you, or different classes of treatment, you'd give both. Now, you could, I, I, I was very surprised by the, the, the lack of the extra impact from giving two treatments. So I, I maybe have to be a bit more cautious about saying that. But in the next arm of Stampede, uh, the control is going to be um, treatment to the primary plus. Uh, drug treatment okay. of choice, and we're expecting that people will give abiraterone, dostaxel, or whatever, according to availability, not just ADT only. Can I expand on, yeah, on same, that yeah. point? I think yeah. it's very tempting when a good idea comes along to yeah. say, this is what we should do. Yeah. That drug works, that yeah. drug works, we must get better yeah. bang for our buck by using both. Yeah. So I'd really discourage people from going down that pathway, and I think what we've seen here is we need the evidence to guide our treatment. Totally agreed, and we see some part, I mean a sparse part of evidence in Titan. 17% of the patient had local treatment, about 7% radical prostatectomy, and 10% radiation to the primary. Yeah. So I think, and they, in the subgroup analysis, uh, benefit from apalutamide treatment. So we have some part of sub-analysis surely knowing that this is not the primary endpoint, yeah. but uh, I think this is uh, where the trend is going to. We have this data with docetaxel as well, I think it's a very good point. So within the RTM1, around 10% had docetaxel, and the hazard ratio for benefit from radiotherapy is the same, whether or not you had um, uh, prior docetaxel. So justified so to give. It, obviously underpowered, but it, it suggests that it's reasonable to give both. And still, I don't know, but in, in Titan, we had to the time to initiate enough apalutamid. We could have six months ADT. In Ensamid, uh, I think it was uh, four months. Uh, time until you intensify treatment. So you have some four months to half a year where you can discuss with the patient and look at the PSA what happens when you do treatment of the primary. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think we need to draw the conversation to a close uh, now, but uh, I mean, I, I guess, you know, the good news is that all of these studies are coming back positive. I think it's very clear that ADT alone is no longer the standard of care um, for anybody with newly diagnosed metastatic prostate cancer. I mean, you should consider other treatment for everybody. Clearly, there will be some patients not suitable. Um, and actually, there's a choice out there. Um, and um, there's no clear guidance. The possible exception of the radiotherapy group as to exactly how we choose and so we probably shouldn't regret too much the choices that our patients make. I think that's a very important point. Yeah. yeah. Well thanks very much it's been great talking to you, to you all here um, uh, so we'll just draw to a close now the ASCO meeting is coming to an end and um, we've had a great few days. Mm -hmm.